been to a couple of good friends over there. I want to uh, take an on-the-air opportunity today to thank some of these people for their friendship and their help. I've got John Christie, who sings at the uh, London Lee Nightclub. I've got uh, Bert Padell, who writes poetry, who wants to do a poem today for Virginia Mayo. I've got uh, Joe Weiss, who writes those articles about me in Celebrity Magazine. The one here about uh, Barbara Streisand, who began on this program, and the one about Liza Minnelli, which will be in the forthcoming issue, who began on this program at the request of a young lady named Judy Garland. I've got a very exciting lady who has written The Gift of Chaos. She talked about chaos. I think this is where chaos begins on this program, but it usually uh, works itself out. I guess, I guess, Ms. Mayo, even a movie could be a chaotic situation, but somehow at the end, the movie gets made, right? Right. They always do. Just like a show, it always goes on. How do you feel? <laughs> I feel great today. Just marvelous. I got a very good night's sleep. That, that's always the way I gauge myself. If I get a good sleep, I always feel good. My guest who feels good and looks good is a movie star of the first magnitude. She is everybody's absolute favorite leading lady, including mine. And this young lady has uh, co-starred with every... Uh, Every redhead from Danny Kaye, he had red hair, didn't he? Yes. James Cagney have red hair? Yes. Did Michael your... O'Shea, my husband had red hair. Michael O'Shea, your husband had red hair? Yes. Did you meet him making a movie, Virginia Mayo? Yes, I met Mike, uh, well, he was doing uh, a picture at Goldwyn Studio where I was under contract and I wanted to get into the picture. So I went to see the director who was on the set and there was Mike and that's how I met him. That couldn't have been Jack London. It was Jack London. That was one of his right. great... The first time I saw Michael O'Shea on the screen, and I had never heard of him, he was already opposite Barbara Bob Stanley. Barbara Stanley. The in... G-String Murders. Right. Mm -hmm. He started as a star, didn't he? he started, yes, he... he did. He was on Broadway here, so, you know, that's how he was discovered. And he was brought to Hollywood to do uh, uh, Eva St. Mark. That's how he was dis discovered. And then he was brought by um, Herb Str uh, Stromberg, a, dur a producer to uh, be in a picture called G-String Murders. He, he was good, he was good in the movies, but I don't think he ever got the parts that he deserved. No, I, think, I, I think... don't think so either. He had a dynamic personality and it was never really fulfilled uh, to his great ability, as I knew he was a great talent. Michael O'Shea, who was the Virginia Mayo's uh, husband for a long time, uh, I'm glad to make that point in public, in my opinion, was better than most of the parts that he got, but he got good parts, but he was yes, better. Yes, he was better, that's right. Was that a dream, was a, happy marriage for a long time? Oh, yes. It was a great marriage. Lovely. He's, um, he's missed now very much. I loved him deeply, and now he's gone three years. I saw him in a long-running TV series. Everybody on that series is it's gone. It's a great life. Everybody Jimmy is Jimmy Dunn, Bill Bishop, and uh, Mike. It's called It's a Great Life. Barbara Bates. Barbara Bates and Francis Bavier. It's very scary. And that yeah. series wasn't that long ago, either. It's, no, it was uh, 1953, 54, 55. Ran three years. It was very successful. Everybody loved it. I don't hear anyone ever say they didn't like that series. Did, that Hollywood, did Hollywood ever tend to typecast any of its uh, people? Actor, yeah, people or oh, actors? yes. They always tried. But in a way, that wasn't too bad because the people who were typed uh, made a groove in the public's image uh, as to being that type. So they were never forgotten, so to speak. Now, I was very versatile. And I didn't make the deep enough groove in the people's minds to have established a type. I was never a type, you see. So that's probably a disadvantage in a way. You think so? I do. You were uh, every kind of a type. I think you made one of the biggest grossing movies ever called She's Working Her Way Through College. Yes, that's my favorite picture. With Ronald Reagan. Right. And Gene Nelson. Ronald Reagan for the love interest, Gene <laughs> Nelson for the dancing interest. Yes. And Pat Wymore and Phyllis Thaxter. Don DeFore, it was a great cast, really a good cast. And then there was a sequel with Virginia Mayo called... She's Back on Broadway. She's Back on Broadway. <laughs> Boy, you're really up on my, what I've been doing. I know every movie. <laughs> it's a movie, long time every ago, movie too. from everybody. I, now, the other night I watched That's TV good. and I saw Captain Horatio Hornblower. Oh, you did? Great. That yeah. was marvelous with Gregory Peck. And you? The one and only Gregory Peck. Were you at all concerned about, uh, or was the director concerned about you having a good English accent? No, no, because uh, it was made primarily for the English-speaking peoples of the world, which included America, so we didn't want to be too English. As a matter of fact, everybody had to tone down the accents, including the British actors who were in the film. They all had to speak with a decided uh, American, Americanese style. So um, 
it turned out to be a great picture. I think Gregory Peck was marvelous in it. He was great to work with, too. I loved him. Superb. Wasn't he marvelous? What a beautiful voice. We did a whole thing here the other day with uh, Louise Reiner talking about a few of her leading men. I, you know, oh, I, yeah. Uh, so we, we can't escape some of the leading men, but of course, no. uh, the star is you. No. When I, did I ever see you on Broadway with Eddie Cantor? Yes, you did. In? Uh, Banjo Eyes was All the right. name of it. You were a baby. You were a little... I was a little girl. Tiny baby. <laughs> I was only 10 years old. About? <laughs> no, I was, <laughs> I was of age. Uh, I was in that show, and it was a delight to be in it, working with Eddie Cantor. It was fun. Now, he was, you see, I was with this horse act. Right. The audience, you probably know, but the audience may not know. And we toured vaudeville for many years. Right. Then we were asked to join this show with uh, Eddie Cantor, and Cantor was, a, it was a three men on a horse put to music. And Cantor was supposed to talk to these horses. And in a dream sequence, the horses were supposed to come to life and tell him the winners. Uh, this one particular horse was fashioned to look like Eddie Cantor. Had black, a black face and big black eyes. The, the lids would move like Eddie Cantor's eyes were awfully big, if you remember. Sure. And uh, the, the horse would do this and look funny. And Well, Cantor was not really able to work with the horse to the advantage of getting laughs. So they said, well, Virginia, you will have to do what Cantor was supposed to do. So I did that. And having worked with a horse so much, I knew exactly what the moves were to get the laughs. So I was in that part of the show, and I had a small part, and I did a little dancing in it. I was sort of jack of all trades in the show. Virginia Mayo of all trades. You know who used to sit here and talk about you and Eddie Cantor in that show? Jacqueline and Suzanne. Oh, yeah. She wrote, you know, somebody told me she wrote, um, she was in the play. Sure. She, she had a part in, in it. In Banjo Eyes. Banjo Eyes. Sure. She wrote the book, the first one. Valley of the Dolls. She based that character on me, the part of Neely. I heard that rumor. Neely and uh, a c composite of Judy Garland and me, the kid from Vaudeville. I was from Vaudeville. And that. You know, I used to wonder when Jackie would look at me so much when we were doing rehearsals and doing whatever, and she'd stand there and stare at me, just stare for the longest time. And I'd say, what, what is she staring at me for? They still do stare at Virginia Mayo. And I'll tell you one thing that... Uh, Maybe she was conjuring up this book in her mind then. King Morton wants to sing some romantic songs to you later on today, so... He does? You better not leave oh, us yet. Oh, no. I just want to make it very official that uh, I've got to see Miss Mayo's current endeavor, and it's called... You tell me. Good news. At the... Paper Mill Playhouse in Milburn, New Jersey. You enjoying that? I am indeed. Will you be uh, traveling with it, too? Well, we're going to one other theater. We're going to uh, Cape Cod at uh, Dennis Hyannis uh, Melody, Melody Tent Theater. You know, I look at you, you talk about melody or memory or, or, or uh, medley. I, I think of so many movies. I think of you as James Cagney's very tough wife yes, in White, White Heat. Heat. That was a, really a great picture. Did you enjoy getting slapped around by James Cagney? Oh, any day. Any day, right? <laughs> any day. He was such a talent to work with. Oh, it was so thrilling. You played a mall. Working. Yeah, gun <laughs> mall. That was fabulous. And with Raoul Walsh directing, who could go wrong? Right. You know, when you act with Jimmy Cagney, you don't have to act. He, you just react because he just gives off all these fireworks and you just sit there and just throw back a few. I don't imagine, Miss Mayo, that many people have been in touch with James Cagney recently. He's kind of no, semi-retired. I know. He's, he's retired, and I, I had, had some illness recently. I hope he's over it. A mild but, stroke, they say. Yeah, I yeah. hope he's better. Great person. The whole family is a great group. Who would you want to be like when you were a kid? Any certain actress that... Uh... Well, I wanted to look like Lana Turner. You really did? Yes, I did. But uh, I, wasn't look I wasn't looking at all like Lana Turner. The first young. time you saw yourself on the movie screen, you said to yourself, oh, no. what? I said, oh, no, I'll never make it. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? You made it. You know who talks about you a lot on our program? Milton Berle. Milton Berle says... Oh, yes, he's great. He's he want, marvelous. He wanted Good. to be as big in movies as on TV, and you were in his... Uh, uh, I was in his first picture. I think it was his first starring picture. Always leave him Always back. leave him laughing. Didn't quite work out that way in movies for him, but it was a good picture. Oh, uh, well, that doesn't matter. He's a star in so many mediums. That's the answer. You no. Know, he's a star, period. Funny man. Funny man. And you know, Milton does not have any ego, as some people do. You can notice it, but Milton doesn't. He's terribly smart. You know, he grasps things and holds it. And he's, he doesn't have a lot of 
I love me. You can see it in him. All right. You can see it in people when they like themselves. You really can. <laughs> he's but not an ego man. No, no, he's not. What about no. Alan Ladd? You worked with Alan Ladd. I did, and I really enjoyed Alan Ladd. He was the sweetest man I ever worked with. Really? Yes. I believe that. He was also typecast as kind of a cold-faced gangster. Yes, After he yes. made this gun for hire, he was always... That must tough, have made him, tough. made him sad, though. Uh, Alan was sad because he made it monetarily. He was a very rich man. Yes. And he was very talented in his way. He had took a lot of criticism from people who would put down his acting ability, which was wrong. Alan was very sensitive, super sensitive. And I think he was a very fine actor. He had a gorgeous speaking voice. He had a style of delivery, which he couldn't do in every phase of acting, but he, he used it to great advantage in the style that he made his. Uh, and in one movie I made with him, I'll never forget the great expressive face he had, a beautiful face, the most beautiful face I've ever seen. And uh, in the scene, I was telling him that I had married and he was in love with me, and this hurt him so deeply. Yes. And when I looked at his face, I saw the hurt on his face. I've never forgotten, because it was a beautiful expression that was captured fully by the camera. He had a, a beautiful f nose, eyes, face. It, it was really beautiful. And he expressed it more beautifully than I've ever seen it ex expressed by any actor, this, this uh, hurt look, this very hurt, touched look. Hmm. Gorgeous. Sensitive man. Very sensitive man. Short. He was short. He was just my height. Right. I mean... Which is about? I'm about 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, mm -hmm. You generally look taller on the movie screen. Yeah, well, we usually would arrange it that way. But uh, that doesn't matter when you're, you have good, you know, something. When you my have guess, sparks or You've star. got the sparks, too. My guest is Virginia Mayo, and we're discussing some of her movies and some of her uh, leading men and some of the... Now, some people say that the uh, best years of our lives, they still say today, is the best movie ever made in the whole history. They say that today? Still. It's, it's, maybe it's faded a little bit, but, but you were Dana Andrews' no good wife? Yes, that was a good part. That was a beautifully written picture. Uh, Robert Sherwood wrote it. Right. And that you can't do any better than that. Was there a big difference, let's say, working for Samuel Goldwyn, who was the independent uh, mogul, and working for a major studio such as Warner Brothers? Was it a big, big difference? They were different, very different. Samuel Goldwyn had his hand in everything. Right. And that's why it was called the Goldwyn Touch, because right. it was. They, every picture he put out was an excellent, excellent, gorgeously produced picture. He s would spare no amount of money to make it the quality picture which he strove to make. And I dare say he achieved it. Any Goldwyn picture, you can say, had quality. Everyone. And every picture. And it was a, a joy to work with him. And I was with them five years because he gave me personal attention. And he would say, you're progressing. I want you to watch this film of yourself. That's where you're better. You're better in that scene than you've ever been, etc. Do things like that. He would take me into the projection room. And he and Mrs. Goldwyn were so kind to me in telling me what I did right and what I did not so good. And uh, he always sent me to the finest coaches to coach me in speaking and uh, carriage and uh, projection of personality. The w one thing I had to learn that nobody could teach me, however, was to become at ease in front of the camera. That's one thing I had to overcome. By yourself? Yeah. And I finally did it, and then I start to roll, you know, and I, I would progress and become easier in my work and I enjoyed it so much and then when I did move to Warner Brothers I must say I was prepared to go into a big major studio but if Goldwyn, I, Goldwyn was, was uh, he was my preparation point. he was the preparation point, yes right. and I was grateful to have him guide me and so on but but when I went to Warner Brothers yes. I was I was able to uh, you know really start off and roll with all the different varieties of uh, parts I was going to get subsequently. Goldwyn had all the comedians when they were red hot. He had Eddie Campbell yeah, long before you. Right. But, then, but then when he got Danny Kaye and he had Bob Hope, uh, yeah. he, need, he needed you to... Uh, yes. Was Danny Kaye tough to keep up with, uh, with that high Danny? energy level? Was he... Oh, no, he was terrific. But, but you, 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 didn't have, you couldn't really sink your teeth into those parts because... No, they weren't uh, meaty roles, you, you, really. You would normally just look at Danny Kaye adoringly and... Uh, right? Right. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, huh? No, Danny was great. I, as a matter of fact, I, I worked with Danny in Vaudeville once. Right. So I knew him very well. Now we were great friends. You did The Secret Life of Walter Mitty? Mm, that was a good picture. 
Up in arms? Up in arms. I played a small part in that. I had to get some training. That was Goldwyn's orders. And then the, the, the first one I did with and Danny where I played opposite him was Wonder Man. Wonder Man, right. And then the kid from Brooklyn, then uh, Secret Life of Walter Mitty, and then a song is born. You've got a medley of uh, hit movies, Virginia Mayo. That's I've, you, you, I've had a lot of good ones. You've got to do a book. Have you thought about it? I've thought about it. Got to do a book. You got some of the stills home, some of the scrapbooks? Oh, I gave all my memorabilia to USC out in California. They asked for memorabilia, and I gave all those stills to them. But I suppose I could round them up to photograph them for a book, you know. If I needed them, I'm sure they'd let me have access to them. That could be a mm -hmm. big Hollywood book, a very important book. Oh, I, you, you make me feel good. I don't know. I never thought about doing it because I never thought I had enough following. Don't kid yourself. I want to say to you, welcome back to the old neighborhood, Broadway. This theatrical <laughs> district makes you feel a little bit... Uh, <laughs> it does. Yeah, it's reminiscent? Really Real? Yeah, very thrilling. The other day, I, I walked down by the Paramount Theater where Billy Rose's old Diamond Horseshoe used to be. Right, know? sure. But I suppose there's nothing down there. Em empty, empty theater. I think it's called the Mayfair now. It is? Uh, That's about it. Wasn't that a great nightclub? I was Wasn't that there, I was there once. I saw... I saw the Memory Lane review before your time with Joe Howard and with all the old time yes. stars. And that was, uh, they really did things great those days. I mean, Billy Rose was a showman. Were, were you a great showman. kind of a chorus girl? Was that the word for no, the way you began? No, I wasn't. As a matter of fact, you know, Billy Rose booked our act in there, Pansy the Horse Act. Right. Uh, and it was, the show was called Mrs. Astor's Pet Horse. Right. Now, Billy Rose said, I don't need the girl, he said to my partners. but. My partner said, well, you must meet her. We won't work. We won't l let her go because she's too valuable to the act. Right. So Billy Rose and I had a conference, and he met me, and he was favorably impressed. He said, oh, I'll make a spot for this girl in the show. So he did. <laughs> he had me do part of the act, and he had me do Mistress of Ceremonies. I did some dancing, a little singing, and he showcased me to such a great degree that I had a lot of offers from people. You took off. And Goldwyn signed me as is on the strength of that. You were a baby. You're from what state originally? Uh, Missouri. Missouri. Mm -hmm. That's good. Because Joe, how do you know all this stuff? That's good because you made so many good westerns. That's why. I did. That was western. so much fun. Oh, I, I love those. I saw one of your westerns the other night on TV called Colorado Territory. That was one of my favorites. With, now, the funny thing is people don't know that that was a remake of High I Sierra. Sierra. Oh, he's marvelous. Except instead of being a, uh, a gangster picture, they made it a Western picture. That's it. You did Ida Lupino's part. That's right. And Joel McRae did Humphrey Bogart's That's part. That's right. Mm -hmm. Directed by Raoul Raul Walsh. Walsh. Same fellow mm -hmm. who directed High Sierra. Yes. <laughs> it was oh, made, that, was, that was made again, by the way. I can't remember. I don't remember what the third again? version. Again? Third it version? It was made again with uh, somebody else. I see Raoul Walsh quite a bit. He's in his 90s now. With the patch on the eye? Yes. He's lost his eyesight, you know, completely. But he's great. He's got a mind like a... He's really fabulous. You're fabulous. He, you know, he said to me last time he talked what? to me, he said, you ought to have somebody make a remake of White Heat. But the way women are in crime these days, you would make it a woman's story, and I would play the part that Jimmy Cagney played. Gorgeous. Isn't that, isn't that a clever that's idea? That's known as women's lib. Listen. That's, that's Raoul Walsh's I've idea. I've got a few huh? people that want to chat with Virginia Mayo, okay? Miss Mayo is currently starring in Good News. That's the part that Alice play, yeah, Alice, Alice Faye travel. Yes, yeah, she played that. Do you know Alice Faye? No, I don't. I don't know her at all. Did you get to meet Lana Turner? Never did. Never did. There's a couple of people I've never met in Hollywood, you know, Hollywood people that are contemporaries. <clears throat> but I like to know most of them. And a lot of them I do know. Do you know Joan that Crawford? Never, never knew her. Now, I'd met her. I'd seen her at Warner Brothers. But I didn't really know her. You had to be close with Betty Davis on that Warner Brothers lot. I uh, no, no, Not she really. left just as I came. That's and then true. We were never, never, uh, never even talked. One time we had our photograph taken together uh, for a cover of a magazine, but we didn't talk much. We just my guest is the <laughs> one and the only and the original leading lady, Miss Virginia Mayo. I got some friends who want to chat with Virginia. Following these, don't forget our schedule every morning nine until ten. Late at night we follow the late movie. I've got a couple of visual effects for Miss Mayo. Some posters of a few of these. We showed a few of these posters to Tony Curtis the other day. And he, oh, you did? You're going to get a kick out of this. But first, these words, let's watch closely. Stay with me, please. Tony Curtis? Oh, the White Wish, we had hours and hours and hours. This is the kind of a show when you talk with Virginia Mayo and uh, yesterday Louise Reiner and last week Tony Curtis. It's, uh, we're hitting the jackpot. You having a good time here today? I sure am, Joe. Love it. You're great. Enjoying it very much. Yeah. That green uh, dress, that's, that's great for uh, 
TV for mm -hmm. color. My favorite color, turquoise. Green? Turquoise, yeah. Turquoise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody saw a movie of yours, they told me, in 3D. Yes. But on TV, it of wasn't course, 3D. It wasn't. Colorado <laughs> Territory. No. No. Devil's Canyon. Devil's Canyon. Mm -hmm. With Dale Robertson. Dale Robertson. Colorado Territory was the one I saw. Mm -hmm. Did you, was it uh, different knowing you were being uh, filmed in 3D? Yes, at first when I saw this huge camera, it was a very elongated thing. Frightened me to death. <laughs> I couldn't do the first scenes because I was a little camera shy. Which but was, I, I got over it. Which was the one with Kirk Douglas? That one was called Along the Great Divide. Along the Great Divide. Yes. That's a semi-classic. It was, very good picture, very dramatic. I loved it because it had such a drama to it. Walter Brennan was marvelous in it. We filmed that in uh, um, California, Lone Pine, and it was cold, freezing cold up there. And we were doing this silly movie, and we had a dust storm. It was so fierce that we had canvas dressing rooms, you know, that was set for us. Right. And the wind just blew them up in the air, took them away. Just my husband and I was huddled in this dressing room and it was just lifted up and flew away. Just like that? Just like that. Hollywood today, of course, is more all over the world than it was then, right? Yes. Today well, they used to do a lot of locations around the country, but not too much uh, in Europe like they do now all over the world, which I, I go with. I think it's great to get all the local color in the picture. <laughs> if it's to be filmed in India, go to India, you know. It makes for a very fine quality to a picture. Has Hollywood given way greatly today to television, would you say, instead of a uh, theatrical movie, really? I think that, well, every movie eventually winds up on television. Right, but so far as series, they employ more people in series than maybe in the making of movies today? Or? Uh, yes, more people are employed in television, I would say. The only thing I have to quarrel with television is that when they take a movie, an old movie, they cut it up so badly that I just abhor that. Really? They just make them botched up till they, you can't even recognize the movie, and I think that's unfair. If they want to do that, why not take it in two sections and show it right. one night and then another night the second half? But why botch it up like that? You've it's not noticed, fair. You've noticed that in your own movies. My own time. movies. It's a crime. This is one of the few stations here where if a movie uh, is supposed to end at 10 o'clock, but it runs till till 10, 11 or 10, mm. 15, they'll let it run, which I well, think that's is good. beautiful If policy. they don't cut them up, I, I object strongly to that because after all, the director and the producer, the writers and the actors all contribute to making a good picture. Why should they just all of their own insensitivity, you know, just chop it to pieces? It's not fair. My guest is the very sensitive Virginia Mayo, <laughs> and this is going to be a show for the archives. They tell us we've got one of the most complete archives in the world, and with Virginia Mayo in the collection now, it's going to be... <laughs> I, I've got a few of my friends here that I just want them to drop in and say hello to you. Now, I went to see London Lee. What's the name of the club? Spindle Top. And uh, it's upstairs there. Upstairs, the cabaret upstairs. It's on 47th Street between Broadway and 8th. And Virginia, I caught this young fellow singing John Christie. I told him I was going down one day and sing in person, but that's for now just to sit here with him. What's been any of your uh, reaction so far to the lovely and glamorous Virginia well, Mayo? I've always been a big fan, actually. And uh, I'm sure when I get home and uh, see the show again, and my, my mother sees the show, she'll be thrilled to death, <laughs> as I am, too. It's really a pleasure to be here. I love hearing you sing. Well, if you, uh, we are very cordially invited over to the Spindle Top. If you want to come down to that area, mm -hmm. and uh, where'd you sing last, uh, John? I did Dangerfields. I do Dangerfields regularly. What do you want to tell Miss Mayo, who used to be a very important part of the cabaret scene? What is the cabaret scene like today in 1977? Well, it's it's still still calls for. Uh, Good singers of the Frank Sinatra era, which mm -hmm. that's my idol, mm -hmm. and uh, it's still it's still the same same thing. You know, you still requires a good voice, and you still have to sing. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to ask John about the uh, current scene, Virginia? Anything about Broadway or New York uh, City today? Uh, Not necessarily. No, I, <laughs> I suppose it's the same. I, mainly, I was concerned with the audience. That's a good question. Uh, are they? Uh, a person like me, if I were to do a night nightclub act, would they, the current youngsters, would they appreciate it or would they say, oh, she's from way back that then? That is a fantastic well, question. What's the your feeling? Memorabilia is definitely back in. You know, it's, uh, I think uh, today, the younger people of my age are uh, going both ways. You know, they, they still, they'll definitely like talent of any form, mm -hmm. especially the, uh, 
I mean, that's why I think Frank Sinatra made a big revival. You know, people wanted to see him again. People well, admired he's very it. talented. Now, that point is what I'm saying. If, if the show or the act was good, they would accept it sure. as for being a quality show. Definitely. If Virginia Mayo doesn't do a nightclub act, I'll stage it and format it myself <laughs> for her. Uh -huh. but, and John Christie now come out on either side of you. Right. right? Be, a, be a pleasure. <laughs> Opposite John Christie. This, this you're going to love it. You're going to get a copy of Bert Padell's book. Let's give you one. Well, the, we talked about the dancing role, and she's working her way through college. That was one of my. Did favorites. you prefer the uh, dramatic roles to the uh, musical roles, or which were? Which no, were? I preferred the dancing roles because I was crazy about dancing then. I just loved it. But they might have been Fun harder of. to do. In a, so. Very hard to do. The rehearsing was six, eight weeks. You know, rehearsals. But nevertheless, I. I loved it. I loved all, all the parts I played. I'd like to go and do it all over again. It's funny you mentioned about the typecasting. Now, James Cagney, you think he got typecast for a while as a tough guy, as, as did Edward G. Robinson, but then you did a musical. Yeah, we did a musical together, West Point Story. Which is, I think, the most televised movie on television. I think is it really? A, I see I it hope every... they don't cut it up. I've seen it cut up badly, and I don't like it. With Gene Nelson? Yeah, Doris Day. Of course, Cagney think? outgrew the tough guy parts, and he did that, and he did uh, all. He did uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Well, he got an Oscar for that because he was such a fabulous dancer. Mm. He was great in that. How picture. do you feel about awards in general, Tonys, Oscars, Emmys? Well, I suppose they're they're marvelous to get. I never got any, so no. Uh, oh, they're great. Listen, can't I, knock it. No, you can't knock it. It's great. Well. Sometimes I think, you no, know, years ago there was such competition in pictures. I mean, there were so many great ones made in one year. How could they pick the best? Nowadays, there's so many rotten ones you can only, you know. So this one gets an Oscar, and it's no more an Oscar picture than The Man in the Moon, but it wins an Oscar. Where the years ago, there was such competition. Now, just past year, they could not find enough five leading ladies that had five leading roles in pictures to give an Oscar to. So a, practically an, an, an unknown lady got an Oscar for practically her first award. I mean, her first picture, she got an award for being an Oscar winner. Virginia Mayo you know what knows, I mean? and her name was? Louise Fletcher. Uh, Ms. Mayo knows whereabouts she speaks. This next young man didn't want to come on TV, but I want you to meet him. He's uh, a writer. What was the title of Celebrity Magazine? That was very recently, right? Yes. Did you enjoy that part? No. After I decided to do it, I thought I made a mistake because it was such a little bitty part. And then we started to shoot it. They said, you'll be there at 6 o'clock in the evening. And uh, my goodness, we didn't get to that till 3 in the morning. I was so exhausted, I couldn't even think straight. A specific question I'd like to ask Miss Mayo is this. <clears throat> Why did you and your husband both conjointly quit Hollywood at the peak of your career. I mean, I could understand somebody who was on the downgrade, no. but the two of you were well up there. He was considered the, uh, right up there with Spencer Tracy as a natural successor. That's the to late Michael you, O'Shea, right. <clears throat> and good, you were was, definitely good question. considered well, that was about 19 without, irrefutably one of the three top sex goddesses, irrefutably, by anybody's standards. Virginia? I don't know. I just didn't get any offers. <laughs> any offers? Were you ridiculous. disillusioned with one, the way Greta Garbo didn't like the way she looked in her last picture, and she walked away? Maybe you didn't like one of your parts at that time. No. I, if I had gotten good offers, I would have taken them, but I didn't get any offers. But why did both of you quit together? I don't understand. Maybe that. they went touring and so I remember I think, that well, you I'll even you what, made, uh, My made husband statements was not very press. well. He oh, had I a, see. kind of a problem with his health. Oh, I see. And he wanted to, you know, rest. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to keep working, but uh, I, as I said, I didn't get any offers. What did you do mm -hmm. uh, uh, from the time you left? I, I saw you on a commercial together. Uh, I don't remember what the commercial was about at this late stage, but I know that was the that two of you were on a commercial together. Yeah. I did a movie in Europe. In 60, 1960, mm -hmm. and uh, then we we went to Ireland and we looked over Ireland for about an eight month period, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that was way into 1961 and 62 when that happened. So uh, I'd love to know what your uh, name was before us, Virginia Mayo. Virginia Clara Jones. Virginia Jones. <laughs> Did you make a movie called The Girl on Jones Beach? <laughs> yes. That was your beach. <laughs> My beach. <laughs> I own the beach. <laughs> I want to thank Joe Weiss for the uh, nice articles and celebrity. I want to tell you, Bert, that keep on writing those nice poems. John, you're going to, uh, if Virginia does a nightclub act, you and I are going to join the act, Definitely. right? <laughs> a couple of, uh, Good idea. Souvenirs here. Devil's oh, Candy. Oh, my what is goodness. That? We mentioned that. We mentioned yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that was made in a prison. All right.
right? What would, it cost, what would it cost to make She's Back on Broadway today compared to the days when they first made a musical like that? Many, many times more, I'm sure, right? Yes, so. Mayo Marvelous. Oh, not pretty. Who's that kid? That's me. <laughs> the Iron oh, Mistress? Oh, yeah, the Iron Mistress. I love that. That's one of my favorites. The big land. Oh, yeah, the big land. Most of all, a young fellow wants to sing to you, and he'll do it following these words, okay? Stay with us and never leave us. Watch. And he was brought to Hollywood to do uh, uh, Eva St. Mark. That's how he was dis discovered. And then he was brought by um, Herb Str uh, Stromberg, a, a producer, to uh, be in a picture called G-String Murders. He, he was good. He was good in the movies, but I don't think he ever got the parts that he deserved. No, I, think, I, I think... don't think so either. He had a dynamic personality and it was never really fulfilled. Uh, to his great ability, as I knew he was a great talent. Michael O'Shea, who was the Virginia Mayo's uh, husband for a long time, uh, I'm glad to make that point in public, in my opinion, was better than most of the parts that he got. But he got good parts, but he was yes, better. Yes, he was better. That's right. Was that a dream, was... a happy marriage for a long time? Oh, yes. It was a great marriage. Lovely. He's, um, he's missed now very much. I loved him deeply, and now he's gone three years. I saw him in a long-running TV series. Everybody on that series is It's gone. a Great Life. Everybody Jimmy is Jimmy Don, Bill Bishop, and uh, Mike. It's called It's a Great Life. Barbara Bates. Barbara Bates and Francis Bavier. It's very scary. And that yeah. series wasn't that long ago, either. It's... No, it was uh, 1953, 54, 55. Ran hmm. three years. It was very successful. Everybody loved it. I don't hear anyone ever say they didn't like that series. Did Isn't Hollywood? That did Hollywood ever tend to typecast any of its... Uh, People? Actor, yeah, people or actors. Oh, yes, they always tried. But in a way, that wasn't too bad because the people who were typed uh, made a groove in the public's image uh, as to being that type. So they were never forgotten, so to speak. Now, I was very versatile, and I didn't make the deep enough groove in the people's minds to have established a type. I was never a type, you see. So that's probably a disadvantage in a way. You think so? I do. You were uh, every kind of a type. I think you made one of the biggest grossing movies ever called She's Working Her Way Through College. Yes, that's my favorite picture. With Ronald Reagan. Right. And Gene Nelson. Ronald Reagan for the love interest, Gene Nelson for the dancing interest. Yes, and Pat Wymore and Phyllis Thaxter. Don DeFore. It was a great cast. Really a good picture. And then there was I a sequel it. with Virginia Mayo called... She's Back on Broadway. She's Back on Broadway. <laughs> Boy, you're really up on my what I've been doing. <laughs> I know every it's a long movie. time ago. Every movie from everybody. I, I, now the other night I watched That's TV good. and I saw Captain Horatio Hornblower. Oh, you did? Great. That yeah. was marvelous with Gregory Peck. And you? The one and only Gregory Peck. Were you at all concerned about, uh, or was the director concerned about you having a good English accent? No, no, because uh, it was made primarily for the English-speaking peoples of the world, which included America. So we didn't want to be too English. As a matter of fact, everybody had to tone down the accents, including the British. to a couple of good friends over there. I want to uh, take an on-the-air opportunity today to thank some of these people for their friendship and their help. I've got John Christie, who sings at the uh, London Lee Nightclub. I've got uh, Bert Padell, who writes poetry, who wants to do a poem today for Virginia Mayo. I've got uh, Joe Weiss, who writes those articles about me in Celebrity Magazine. The one here about uh, Barbara Streisand, who began on this program, and the one about Liza Minnelli, which will be in the forthcoming issue, who began on this program at the request of a young lady named Judy Garland. I've got a very exciting lady who has written The Gift of Chaos. You talk about chaos. I think this is where chaos begins on this program, but it usually uh, works itself out. I guess, I guess, Miss Mayo, even a movie could be a chaotic situation, but somehow at the end, the movie gets made, right? Right. 
They always do, just like a show. It always goes on. How do you feel? <laughs> I feel great today, just marvelous. I got a very good night's sleep. That, that's always the way I gauge myself. If I get a good sleep, I always feel good. My guest who feels good and looks good is a movie star of the first magnitude. She is everybody's absolute favorite leading lady, including mine. And this young lady has uh, co-starred with every year. Uh, Every redhead from Dandy K. He had red hair, didn't he? Yes. James Cagney have red hair? Yes. Did Michael your... O'Shea, my husband, had red hair. Michael O'Shea, your husband, had red hair? Yes. Did you meet him making a movie, Virginia Mayo? Yes. I met Mike. Uh, well, he was doing uh, a picture at Goldwyn Studio where I was under contract, and I wanted to get into the picture. So I went to see the director who was on the set, and there was Mike, and that's how I met him. That couldn't have been Jack London. It was Jack London. That was one of his great. Right. The first time I saw Michael O'Shea on the screen, and I had never heard of him, he was already opposite Barbara, Barbara Stanwyck. Stanley. The in... G-string G murders. Right. Mm -hmm. He started as a star, didn't he? he started, yes, he... he did. He was on Broadway here, so, you know, that's how he was discovered. The actors who were in the film, they all had to speak with a decided uh, American, Americanese style. So um, it turned out to be a great picture, I think. Gregory Peck was marvelous in it. He was great to work with, too. I loved him. Superb. Wasn't he marvelous? What a beautiful voice. We did a whole thing here the other day with uh, Louise Reiner talking about a few of her leading men. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so we, we can't escape some of the leading men, but of course, no. uh, the star is you. No. When I, did I ever see you on Broadway with Eddie Cantor? Yes, you did. In? Uh, Banjo Eyes was right. the name of it. You were a baby. You were a little. I was a little girl. Tiny baby. <laughs> I was only 10 years old. About? <laughs> no, I was, <laughs> I was of age. Uh, I was in that show, and it was a delight to be in it, working with Eddie Cantor. It was fun. Now, he was, you see, I was with this horse act. Right. The audience, you probably know, but the audience may not know. And we toured vaudeville for many years. Right. Then we were asked to join this show with uh, Eddie Cantor, and Cantor was, a, it was a three men on a horse put to music. And Cantor was supposed to talk to these horses. And in a dream sequence, the horses were supposed to come to life and tell him the winners. Uh, this one particular horse was fashioned to look like Eddie Cantor. Had black, a black face and big black eyes. With the, the lids would move like Eddie Cantor's eyes were awfully big, if you remember. Sure. And uh, the, the horse would do this and look funny. And Well, Cantor was not really able to work with the horse to the advantage of getting laughs. So they said, well, Virginia, you will have to do what Cantor was supposed to do. So I did that. And having worked with a horse so much, I knew exactly what the moves were to get the laughs. So I was in that part of the show, and I had a small part, and I did a little dancing in it. I was sort of jack of all trades in the show. Virginia Mayo of all trades. You know who used to sit here and talk about you and Eddie Cantor in that show? Jack Will and Suzanne. Oh, yeah. She wrote, you know, somebody told me she wrote, um, she was in the play. Sure. She, she had a part in, in it. In Banjo Eyes. Banjo Eyes. Sure. She wrote the book, the first one. Valley of the Dolls. She based that character on me, the part of Neely. I heard that rumor. Neely and uh, a c composite of Judy Garland and me, the kid from Vaudeville. I was from Vaudeville. And you know, I used to wonder when Jackie would look at me so much when we were doing rehearsals and doing whatever, and she'd stand there and stare at me, just stare the longest time. And I'd say, what, what is she staring at me for? They still do stare at Virginia Mayo. And I'll tell you one thing that... Uh, Maybe she was conjuring up this book in her mind then. King Morton wants to sing some romantic songs to you later on today, so... He does? You better not leave oh, us yet. Oh, no. I just want to make it very official that uh, I've got to see Miss Mayo's current endeavor, and it's called... You tell me. Good news! At the... Paper Mill Playhouse in Milburn, New Jersey. Are you enjoying that? I am, indeed. Will you be uh, traveling with it, too? Well, we're going to one other theater. We're going to uh, Cape Cod at uh, Dennis Hyannis uh, Melody, Melody Tent Theater. You know, I look at you, you talk about melody or memory or, or, or uh, medley. I, I think of so many movies. I think of you as James Cagney's very tough wife yes, in White, White Heat. Yes, White Heat. That was a, really a great picture. Did you enjoy getting slapped around by James Cagney? Oh, any day. Any day, right? <laughs> any day. He was such a talent to work with. Oh, it was so thrilling. You played a mall. Working. Yeah, gun mall. <laughs> that was fabulous. And with Raoul Walsh directing, who could go wrong? Right. You know, when you act with Jimmy Cagney, you don't have to act. 
he you just react because he just gives off all these fireworks and you just sit there and just throw back a few I don't you imagine, know, Ms. Mayo, that many people have been in touch with James Cagney recently. He's kind of no, semi-retired. I know. He's, he's retired, and I, I had, had some illness recently. I hope he's over it. A mild but, stroke, they yeah, say. Yeah. I hope he's better. Great person. The whole family is a great group. Who would you want to be like when you were a kid? Any certain actress that... Uh... Well, I wanted to look like Lana Turner. You really did? Yes, I did. But uh, I wasn't looking. I wasn't looking at all like Lana Turner. The first time you saw yourself on the movie down. screen, you said to yourself, oh, no. "What?" I said, "Oh no, I'll never make it." <laughs> Isn't that terrible? You've made it. You know who talks about you a lot on our program? Milton Berle. Milton Berle says... Oh, yes. He's that, great. He's he marvelous. Wanted, he wanted to be as big in movies as on TV, and you were in his... Uh, uh, I was in his first picture. I think it was his first starring picture. Always leave him Always laughing. Always leave him laughing. Didn't quite work out that way in movies for him, but it was a good picture. Oh, uh, well, that doesn't matter. He's a star in so many mediums. That's the answer. You know, he's a star, period. Funny man. Funny man. And you know, Milton does not have any ego. As some people do, you can notice it, but Milton doesn't. He's terribly smart, you know, he grasps things and holds it. And he's, he doesn't have a lot of, I love me, you can see it in him. Right. You can see it in people when they like themselves. You really can. <laughs> he's but not an ego man. No, no he's not. What about yeah. Alan Ladd? You worked with Alan Ladd. I did, and I really enjoyed Alan Ladd. He was the sweetest man I ever worked with. Really? Yes. I believe that. He was also that. typecast as kind of a cold-faced gangster. Yes, After he yes. made this gun for hire, he was always... That must tough, have made him, tough. made him sad, though. Uh, Alan was sad because he made it monetarily. He was a very rich man. Yes. And he was very talented in his way. He had took a lot of criticism from people who would put down his acting ability, which was wrong. Alan was very sensitive, super sensitive. And I think he was a very fine actor. He had a gorgeous speaking voice. He had a style of delivery, which he couldn't do in every phase of acting, but he, he used it to great advantage in the style that he made his. Uh, and in one movie I made with him, I'll never forget the great expressive face he had, a beautiful face, the most beautiful face I've ever seen. And uh, in the scene, I was telling him that I had married and he was in love with me, and this hurt him so deeply. Yes. And when I looked at his face, I saw the hurt on his face, I've never forgotten, because it was a beautiful expression that was captured fully by the camera. He had a, a beautiful f nose, eyes, face. It, it was really beautiful. And he expressed it more beautifully than I've ever seen it ex expressed by any actor. This, this uh, hurt look, this very hurt, touched look. Hmm. Gorgeous. Sensitive man. Very sensitive man. Short. He was short. He was just my height. Right. I mean... Which is about? I'm about 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, mm -hmm. You generally look taller on the movie screen. Yeah, we usually would arrange it that way. But uh, that doesn't matter when you're, you have good, you know, something. When you my have guess, sparks or You've star. got the sparks, too. My guest is Virginia Mayo, and we're discussing some of her movies and some of her uh, leading men and some of the... Now, some people say that the uh, best years of our lives, they still say today, is the best movie ever made in the whole history. They say that today? Still. It's, it's, maybe it's faded a little bit, but, but you were Dana Andrews' No Good Wife? Yes, that was a good part. That was a beautifully written picture. Uh, Robert Sherwood wrote it. Right. And that you can't do any better than that. Was there a big difference, let's say, working for Samuel Goldwyn, who was the independent uh, mogul, and working for a major studio such as Warner Brothers? Was it a big, big difference? They were different, very different. Samuel Goldwyn had his hand in everything. Right. And that's why it was called the Goldwyn Touch, because right. it was. They, every picture he put out was an excellent, excellent, gorgeously produced picture. He s would spare no amount of money to make it the quality picture which he strove to make. And I dare say he achieved it. Any Goldwyn picture, you can say, had quality. Everyone. And every picture. And it was a, a joy to work with him. And I was with them five years because he gave me personal attention. 